Hi there, welcome to this session. We're going to talk about why we need to map problems. There are three things I want to cover in this short presentation. The first is to illustrate the need to map a problem as to why we need to do it. Analyze a problem to map, and I've got three examples that we can look at. And create somewhat of a toolkit for you in your own personal use. And the purpose of that is to be able to draw upon uh, a wide variety of tools that you might be able to use. And I'm going to give you three different examples of three different situations here that you might be able to use in your quest for better problem solving. Why map problems at all? Well, the first and foremost reason is to understand the multiple perspectives that are existing in a problem situation. So we call it a situation because it's uh, got many different actors and stakeholders and people that make the pro problem relevant to explore. So for example, if you take uh, things like sustainability or climate change, there are different viewpoints on that. Of those viewpoints, there are people that are against it, people that are for it, people that think it's a great idea, people on the science side, people on the non-science side. So there's lots of different people that make the problem what it is. If you consider another problem, something like traffic or something like urbanization, it has its own set of problems. And last week, at the time of this recording, I was in a confirmation research seminar where someone was defending their thesis and something they said was quite interesting and it was... We can look at problems from the urban point of view, like planning problems and food delivery problems and, you know, trying to keep all enough food in the planet to feed everybody and issues like universal basic income from multiple different angles at the same time. But really, you're trying to figure out how to solve poverty. And that's the thing. You can actually enter a problem from multiple different points of view. All of them can be relevant at the same time. And the reason that that's a case is because a complex problem has layers. And there are there's like a... A cascading effect, uh, one of my research students came up with that term, there's a cascading effect from the top to the bottom where the biggest issue is swallowed up by lots of smaller issues as well. Think about different political agendas. In, in America and, and increasingly in Australia, we have this divisive system of left versus right, which is in, in a lot of people's traditions a very silly way to look at politics. And it's divisive because it puts people in different camps. It's not very progressive in that way. So people are critical of it from that point of view. But you might be also critical of the progressive movement, saying you people are just left-wing uh, people in disguise. So you have these kinds of different perspectives or different agendas that see the world differently but have a different take on the problem. And that's one of the, they're the main two reasons you might want to map a problem. Meaning. Meaning is about the symbols in a, in a problem. Like why do people take meaning or issue with it? And this may seem really academic and strange at this point in time, but think about it from this point of view. Imagine you're running a, a large business and you've got suppliers and they don't understand your culture. So when they come to negotiate with you, they don't understand what you mean. So they will look at the problem that you see and they'll see an opportunity perhaps to get a better price because of the way that you communicate or the way that you turn up late to meetings and things like that. Meaning is incredibly important in a mess messy, wicked, complex problem situation. The reason is because the meaning is up for grabs. If you knew what it meant and you knew what the problem really was, you wouldn't have to map it. You would be understanding it and you would have the solution at hand. I'll show some more examples of that in a minute. It's very important that you understand that, that uh, the way that we see the world determines what the meaning we draw from it and the meaning we draw from it is often shared by others and we form groups and societies and communities and cultures around that uh, like co coffee culture here in Brisbane's on the rise you know the restaurant culture or fancy cars you know whatever it is people draw meaning out of those things but the way that you derive meaning will be different from other groups of people and you must be aware of that and if you can map and understand what they mean you will optimize your problem solving process massively. Boundary judgments or arguments. Boundary judgments refer to, and we'll talk about this on the following slide, but they, they refer to where the problem is and isn't relevant to consider. So where, where do you draw the line is a phrase that people often use. And the truth of the matter is you draw it wherever you think you should. And, you know, and arguments will, uh, like a colleague of mine, used to say an argument is not necessarily a heated debate but it's a way of looking at something to consider it from different angles to try and get to quote unquote an approximation of the truth 
Um, so let's have a look at a couple of examples now, but think about your own life, that last one. If you think of your property or a house you live in, even that has a boundary judgment. There's a fence there, right? And if you step onto the other person's properties, a different set of laws apply. It's the same thing in solving difficult problems in the workplace. Where is it your responsibility and where is it their responsibility? Or how could you make an argument that it was your responsibility? This idea comes from a scholar called Werner Ulrich, and he was really interested in the meaning of um, how we solve debates in the public sector. So this is way back in the early 80s. And you'll see on the left there, it's like the people who are involved in the problem are on the left and the affected groups are on the right. And that boundary is where the two intersect. And he said there were two different boundaries, the boundary of the affected and the boundary of the involved, and they often overlap. So if you think of this in a sim more simplistic way, if you're on the strategy end of something, or you're in the CEO's office, you won't often understand what's going on in the day-to-day -day operations of the company to the last detail. You can get reports about it from your direct reports, or you can get, you can wander around and, and observe, but you will never fully understand the meaning of the affected. Now, why is this important? Well, it, it's important because there's a point at which making certain decisions has no impact. And in a complex problem, you have to make a decision on when you're going to finish it. Where is it going to end? Where is the actual boundary? And for that reason, you've got to consider, and this is the main reason to map problems, is you want to understand where to start and where to finish. So who was affected, who was not affected, who was involved, who was not involved? And to, to me, this is the best argument for mapping problems that I've been able to find. And he was the first of a long line of people really to consider um, how do we start discussions around important issues and problems and how do we dive more deeply into understanding the areas that are impacted and not impacted? So in that regard, it's important that you understand those boundaries and have a good understanding of where you're going to uh, stop solving the problem. Now, the, the thing for that is, if you don't stop, you can go on forever because society is endless. There's multiple different connections and groups and networks. You seriously could explore some issues for the rest of your natural life and never have a satisfied ending, satisfying ending. And you could always continue and keep going and have all kinds of problems and all kinds of things that you were dealing with. Take, for example, this issue of housing. This came from a paper I wrote a long time ago. I was trying to get to the bottom um, of why houses were so expensive in Brisbane. So they're not as expensive here now as they, th sorry, they're way more expensive here now than they were 11 years ago when I wrote this. Um, and they're almost double the price they were in Sydney and Melbourne and Canberra and Hobart and Adelaide and Perth and Darwin. And um, so things keep going up, right? And so when we were mapping this problem, we looked at the government, its relationship to developers and the economy. Developers are powered by investors who want capital and returns. And one of the arguments made, this wasn't my argument, by the way. This is the argument of an article that um, I managed to get out of a magazine. They were saying one of the drivers for the housing crisis could possibly be greed and wanting more money. And when you explore the problem, it's probably not, that's just one concept you could use to look at. But what you could do is that you could take that concept of greed here and you could replace it with the concept of wealth building or you could replace it with the concept of safety. And by using these concepts, what we can do is begin to unpack the meaning of the problem and begin to understand its boundaries. And it's, it's important to be able to do this. So I've gone all the way up to the government here. And this is an oversimplification of the problem. And uh, we might be thinking of long-term intergenerational wealth. We might be thinking of our children. If we don't have children, we might be thinking of our future um, charitable donations or whatever we're going to leave, our legacy, if you want to call it that. Could be any any word you could put in there that can fit. And so what we, I often do is get people to draw up these things and then pull out one word and put in another word to try and make sense of what's happening. The beautiful part about this is that you can do this with anything. And that's the point of mapping a problem, is to understand why and how, and most importantly, where 
you stop mapping and conceptualizing a problem. Because really, it could be any one of these things that are driving it, but it's probably a combination of all of these things that create it. But as someone who's probably not got the money to go and approach developers, uh, it may not be in my best interest. And I showed this to someone who was in the industry about three or four years ago who worked for Meriton, and he was talking about how uh, it was partially correct this, partially but not quite right, because they were talking about the oversupply of units in Brisbane. And I said, what caused the oversupply? And he said, a lot of investors wanted to keep building units, so Meriton kept building them. But then they had to turn around and come up with a strategy to fill those units up with people. That consequently was solved by the population explosion in Brisbane. But my point is, it was interesting to see how a lot of these situations were driven by investment choices and needing to keep the business going. And so there's all of these un the under the surface issues, all, all these concepts that are deeply embedded in the situation that you have to explore in more detail to get to some uh, uh, some understanding of how you can model it. But this is just one example. Let's look at another one. Here's an example of a rich picture. Rich pictures come from a methodology for solving problems called soft systems methodology developed by the University of Lancaster and in particular a group of academics connected to a guy called Peter Checklin. Rich pictures are in a way of diagramming a problem in a free, for, free form drawing way, which can be done quite quickly to capture the different perspectives of the problem. So when I normally do these, I will try and do them with, you know, potential clients or people that I've worked with in research. And what we want to do is draw a broad stroke of the problem in an animated style form. So I, I don't have drawing skills. So this is a computer generated example. But you can see in this example here, you've got different people involved. You've got the coroner on one end. What info do I need or what information do I need? You've got the person on the other end, the legal executor. So this is, you know, a police statement request process for someone who's sick or dying. You know, what, what evidence does the doctor need? What does the court need? What does the receptionist need? And so on and so forth. You get the drift. Why, why would we do this? Well, the, all of these people, you'll see where there's people on this. They are connected to someone else. That's a vantage point that you can enter to look at the problem from that particular point of view. And what this does is it gives you a map of the situation so you can pick and think about which areas that you would like to tackle next. And by doing that, you're able to get different vantage point from different points of view. And what actually happens here is you begin to have a richer understanding of the problem, hence the name Rich Picture. The richness there is meant to be like a zooming out of the situation as it is with all the different connections. And then what you can do here is enter this problem situation from any particular angle and then think about how you might model a solution and what that might look like. And for me, what it does is it says, oh, here's the stakeholders. I need to get these people together into a room, help them to understand each other's point of view and then get them to agree on a plan for what Checklin calls desirable and feasible change or change management. What, what transformation are we going to map out of this? So I've used this uh, most recently in trying to understand how small to medium enterprises view advertising because it's something I'm interested in. How do they view it? And, uh, you know, so I, I look, they look at it as highly technical, can't use it. But then you've got the company of Facebook over here or Google that are making $70 billion a year off their advertising. So you have these different takes or different viewpoints of the problem. And what the mapping process does is it simplifies that complexity down into something that can be easily observed. And then you can think about, right. Now, the real power in this, if you've listened to this far, I'll give you the clue. Uh, the real power in this is that you can use these diagrams with the stakeholders in a room together, just like Checklin and others have done in that tradition, and they can see the problem on a screen and they can all understand each other's point of view at the same time. And what that does is it gets the divergent thinking going, the creativity going, and people start to think about how they might want to solve this issue because they begin to understand each other's points of view and see the complex, messy problem and begin to structure it, which is helpful because then you get traction and things start to get better. A more simpler approach, or a simpler approach rather, is concept mapping. Uh, concept mapping is where you take one concept, like this is an example of connecting with nature. This is really a mind map, but I use the terms interchangeably. I think they're the same. 
if you want to get into semantics, concept maps usually uh, have bubbles and no pictures, but I like this one. It's a good example. How do we connect with nature? That's a concept. I want to break that concept down into its constituent parts. On the previous slide, we talked about rich pictures. That's a holistic picture of all the different viewpoints that make the situation what it is. And you can do those for anything. Concept maps, you take a concept like this and you break it down into the things that are related. The big drawback from concept maps, um, and we're using them in this course, is that they uh, are good for mapping simpler um, phases of the problem, but the more complex an issue is, the harder it can be to um, model and map. But concept maps uh, can be used to understand and break down quite difficult issues, like connecting with nature, for example. This is one example. There's ones I've seen on developing a better attitude at work or leadership or whatever it might be. You can break those things down and help people to understand the whole of a dis discipline or a whole of a concept with one simple diagram. They're called a concept map, again, because you're breaking down a singular concept. Where I like to use these in problem solving is to think about a situation I'm involved in. Um, and so I might pick a concept like student retention, and then I want to see what's connected to it. And what that gives me is the opportunity to explore each of those branches and have a look at each branch and think, where could I solve the problem here? Which one of these branches can I have an impact in? And who can I contact or build a partnership with to solve this issue that's a part of this branch? They're similar in rich pictures in that regard because each branch is related to each other, even though they may not be talking to each other. And to me, the biggest benefit of a concept map is the branches show you what's not working or what's not connected. So if I'm thinking of the design of a program or I'm thinking of um, how to get an initiative through, sometimes I'll put up the concept map and then look at the different groups of people who are connected and then systematically go through them and think about why they don't talk to each other. Get them in a room maybe or try to get them to chat to each other to build synthesis and have that creative problem solving experience. Doesn't always work though. Finally, we're looking at the journey map. The journey map is this is a bit hard to see but the journey map explains one particular person's journey and the feelings and thoughts and emotions they have as they're going through now typically this is used in software design and it's used as part of a toolkit to help people understand rapid deployment of software like things like apps and stuff like that but i have used it to understand interactive layers of a person's experience in a complex problem setting so Although I haven't published anything about it yet, I have, um, for example, studied uh, a flow of a nurse in a hospital and understanding her experiences. Um, what it enables you to do is it enables you to take that experience and model and map that experience and then, then get other nurses and other people to look at it and then they can add their own complexity to it there. The real benefit of it is this for me is engagement. So this is going to take a little bit of time to explain. What, what I mean is when you're mapping an experience, it's someone's subjective experience, their life experience or their lived experience, they will tell you certain things along the way. And when you articulate it and map it, you're taking it out of their heads and you're putting it onto a screen or onto a piece of paper. You can feed it back to them and dive a little bit deeper. And it allows you um, to do a couple of things. It, it allows you to understand what I call touch points. It's often used as a marketing term, but I use it to try and understand at what point does this person interact with us or interact with the problem and then the, the problem starts to impact them. So that impact point or a touch point allows us to be able to go right. So when they walk in the hospital, like in this example, they have experience A and they don't know what to do. The quick, the best example I can give you is a hospital because that's the one that I heard of. Um, they've, they've done this here in Queensland, Queensland Health. Say you're walking into a hospital and you've just been hit by a car. You're disoriented, you're injured, you go in there, and now your first touch point is going through the door and going to the emergency desk. You get whisked away. Your second touch point is you're put in a little room and a doctor comes to see you in about half an hour, right? You've got machines coming into you, people are putting things into you, and then the fourth touch point and fifth touch points, sorry, the third, fourth, and fifth touch points might be the doctor comes back, you get moved upstairs, you go into surgery, and that's the point. And what that allows us to do is understand problem solving and problems in particular from that experiential point of view. We can use interviews and surveys to generate this data and then think about when people are moving through a system, 
or going through a process or going through your organization, what are they thinking and feeling? So I like to do three or four of these from different points of view and then compare them, like similar to a rich picture, so that I can figure out where the problems exist in the experience. So in marketing or designing a, a like service design, you might use this in thinking about touch points that increase customer value. So one example that I mapped just recently was a local retailer um, who has a very, and you would have had this experience, who has a very high desire to make first point of contact sales. So you walk in there, can I help you? And they incentivize their, their um, customer service workers with, um, you know, having to reach certain hourly targets. Uh, the reason for that is because they're not able to track their long-term value because they're not interested in that and they, they don't have the technology to do that. But if they did, then they could create a different system around touch points and increase their revenue, right? So people coming back eight or nine times, what do those touch points look like in that, in that customer experience? Where are they coming back the seven or eight times? What questions do they have? What objections do they have? What are they thinking? What are they feeling when they enter the store and someone runs up to them and says, bye, 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 bye. What, what is that kind of telling them? For some people that will be repellent. For other people who are in the buyer mode, that will be probably supportive. So these are the kinds of things that you can map and model with this. Now, in terms of organizational uh, work and organizational linkages, uh, journey maps can be used to understand the experience of staff members. So human resource professionals use journey maps to understand why people are upset or why they're not progressing. So they have a wide array, a wide array rather of application and you can use them in just about any setting. So I've included some videos in the module for you so you can do this one if you prefer. Um, I have no real personal preference. I've got, a, there's a million others. There's things like causal maps, um, you know, there's, you know, the block and arrow type diagrams, there's anything like swimming lanes, you know, there's bunches of them, but these are the best three ones that I've found that capture the richness of a problem and then enable you to give you the capacity to reflect and go back and think about the different parts where you can intervene and make a difference. Thanks for listening to this lecture on problem mapping. Uh, if you have any questions about it, please head over to our online Teams platform or whatever we're using at the time that you're listening to this and ask away. I'll see you in the next one.